in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I'm Hyman Brown. Probably the greatest English writer of the last century could be the novelist H.G. Wells. Wells has lifted our imaginations with the first men on the moon, War of the Worlds, The Invisible Man, and so on. With extraordinary resourcefulness and creativity, he has brought life to the incredible. And today, we have taken his words from the page, placed them in your ear, so that you can actually believe you are in the outlandish world of H.G. Wells. Professor Lidget, can you make out the school desks and the school children? Y yes, I can, and I do. From here they look phosphorescent, luminous, don't they? They do look strange, Platner. Now that explosion blew us a considerable distance away. I must get back to the school and take charge. Well, Professor Lidget, I, I don't think that'll be possible. Why not, indeed? Because I think that you and I are dead. Our mystery drama, Watcher of the Living, adapted from a story by H.G. Wells, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. What will it be this time, Mr. Wells? Mars colliding with Earth? A machine to put you in another century? The problems of loving and living when no one can see you? None of the above? Something completely different. Yes. In fact, in the 90 years of science fiction that followed where H.G. Wells blazed the trail, no one has ever attempted to duplicate the story we tell you now. My name is Fred Plattner. I'm 27. My mother and father passed away when I was 10. I'm a teacher in a small school in Sussexville. So small that one teacher has to do the work of five. Too much work for too little pay. Last week, I heard of a great summer job in town, lifeguard on Sandy Beach. To apply, I first had to get a physical checkup. Mr. Platner, I do not have good news for you. I'm sick, uh, Dr. Bender? No, I, I wouldn't say that. Not sick, but uh, strange. Uh, you mean when you examined me, you found some... I didn't want to say anything until I had the x-rays, but I can tell you this. In all my years of general practice, I have never seen a body like yours. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> will I live? Who knows? Uh, before I show you the x-rays, tell me, young man, why do you want to be a lifeguard? I understand you have an eminently scholarly position as a teacher. Well, that's what everyone tells me, Doctor. But there's no money in it now and no future in it tomorrow. What do you teach? <laughs> what don't I teach? <laughs> Bookkeeping, geography, modern languages, and chemistry which Dr. Lidget, our former principal, threw at me about a month ago. Aye, all those subjects. You must have a vast knowledge. No, I don't. But since my students begin by knowing nothing, all I have to do is bone up from day to day and stay one lesson ahead. What an extraordinary way to run a school. <laughs> In a town of a thousand persons and one and a quarter children per household, I was told by Professor Lidget, the principal, there was no alternative. There are two other teachers besides myself, and that's it. On my present salary, I can hardly save a cent. But if I pass the physical and get this lifeguard position, I could clear $300 this summer. I wish I could help you, Mr. Platner, but the facts don't help me. Uh, let me show you. Uh, look at these, your x-rays. First, notice 
Your heart beats on the right side of your body. Now look at this plate. That is the right lobe of your liver. However, it's on the left side, and the left lobe is on the right side. Uh, tell me, have you noticed any changes in yourself lately? Well, now that you mention it, I have been finding it sort of difficult to write straight across a page the way I used to. You've stopped writing? How do you correct papers? Using my left hand and writing across the paper from right to left. Anything else, Mr. Platner, out of the ordinary? Well, I was never very good at sports, but now I can't throw a ball with my right hand at all. With your left? Not far. And sometimes I get confused at mealtimes, trying to find my knife and fork. I've caught myself quite often trying to cut my meat with my fork and putting it into my mouth with my knife. I'm backwards, is that it? What should be on your right side is on your left. You're sure I haven't always been that way? I asked myself the same question. So I got out your old x-rays from Dr. Jonas's files. The last time you came for a checkup, everything was in its proper place. I wonder... I have a theory, Mr. Platner, uh, which is not easy to substantiate, how this might have occurred to a person. Uh, but my theory could hardly apply to you. It couldn't? There's a mathematical hypothesis that the only way a solid body can be changed is by taking that body clean out of space, as we know it, and inverting it. Oh, my gosh. Much further into space than any astronauts have ever gone, of course, into the fourth dimension, in fact. Uh, but that is a theory, and you, Mr. Platner, are a fact. Obviously, your internal exchange of left for right was not the result of any voyages into the fourth dimension. Oh, but they are. I mean, uh, they could be. You have made such a trip? I have. I was hoping to keep it a secret. Uh, my dear young man, look, getting a job this summer as a lifeguard isn't that important. Oh, but I did. Two weeks ago. I mean, I returned from wherever I was two weeks ago. Didn't you hear about my disappearing from the school? You see, that's where I must have been. In that fourth dimension. Mr. Platner, you're not feeling chilly or flushed, are you? No, I'm fine. So you took a trip into space, did you? Well, I don't know where I was, but I, I certainly wasn't in Sussexville. Mr. Platter, I imagine the tests have been a bit exhausting, so uh, if you'll come into the next room, uh, do you just stretch out on this couch, close your eyes, and rest up a bit. But I'm not tired. Uh, for your own sake, I think lying down won't hurt. You know, when you speak of traveling to other dimensions, even if you can't be a lifeguard this summer, I'd hate you to lose your teaching job because they thought you've lost your mind. Of course, I couldn't really blame Dr. Bendener for thinking somehow I'd become unscrewed. And as I lay down in his ante room, those nine days in nowhere came back to me. Nine days I'd never forget. It began on a Tuesday night, after chemistry class. Why are you still here, Platner? The bell rang. What are all these boys still doing here? They haven't all been kept in, have they? Uh, Professor Lidget, uh, <clears throat> Carson here uh, found some green powder up in the old lime kiln. So I told the boys if they'd like to take part in some scientific research, stay after class and we'll subject the green powder to some scientific tests. Ah. Oh. Oh. Uh, proceed then, Platner. I shall watch with interest. Uh, you don't mind if I stand beside you at the table here? No, no, no. Not at all. Uh, Professor Lidget, we're conducting this experiment to impress upon these boys, uh, Jacoby, Goodman, O'Shea, and, and Carson, that curiosity is not something that should stop after one has left school. So, here is a medicine bottle containing green powder, courtesy of Billy Carson, 
And uh, plugged with a masticated piece of newspaper. Uh, plugged with what? Uh, a large spitball. First, we place a small amount of the green powder into a test tube. Now, uh, we hold the tube under the tap and see what effect is caused by water. Hm. No effect. No change in the substance whatsoever. As you can see, the powder does not even dissolve. Now, uh, we'll prepare a number of test tubes, filling them with a little of Carson's green powder, partially filling each, and then in turn, we'll test the green powder against nitric acid, sulfuric acid, uh, hydrochloric acid. Very disappointing. No results. No changes in the powder. The experiment has yielded us zero. Nix. Naught. Well, boys, those are the hazards of science. Uh, why don't you set fire to some of the powder, Platinum? Light it? With a match? Mm, or a Bunsen burner. Boys, our principal, Professor Lidget, suggests a test by fire. Here we go. We knock a few grains from the bottle onto this slate on our lab table. Professor, would you oblige with a match? Oh, yes, happy to. Ah, it's smoking. The green powder is melting. the explosion, I was lifted off my feet and driven forcibly backwards. I wondered if I'd crashed through the wall or window of the chemistry lab. The next thing I knew, I was thrown to the ground. Platner. Platner, is that you? Professor Lidget, are you hurt? Well, I, I, I don't think so. Me neither. Uh -huh. uh, my my face seems to be all right. <laughs> I still have both my ears, uh, hands, arms, and my feet. Oh, so am I, thank heaven. Uh, but, uh, where's the school? Where are we? N none of this countryside looks familiar to me. Look. Straight in front of us. Huh? Those figures. I know those boys. They're in my bookkeeping class. But how strange they look. Sort of gray and amorphous. Almost floating. Are those gray shapes there? Those are our students? I can see their lips move. They're talking. But I can't hear a word they're saying. And they're coming towards us. The one in front is Johnson. Gray! Heavens! He just walked right through you. <laughs> I know. And I didn't feel a thing. Did you notice how dark it is getting? Above us, the sky is jet black. The only light is that greenish glow on the horizon in those black hills. <laughs> where, where are we? Well, I can still see the chemistry classroom, but seems to be receding getting fainter. Yes, I can see it too, way off there. It's as though I had X-ray eyes and can see right through the walls. Uh, we must get back. We've been blown a considerable distance away. I must take charge. Well, I, I doubt that that will be possible, sir. As I analyze it, uh, A, no one sees us... B, no one hears us. C, the boys walk right through us. D, yet we appear whole and uninjured. E, to ourselves we are real, but the school seems unreal. Therefore, I would conclude, uh, ergo... What, 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 what? That you and I, Professor, are dead. Well, now, have we...
Have we just heard from the living, or should I say, speaking dead? How's that for a first act curtain? The shape of things to come, things beyond have always intrigued men. If, as some philosophers believe, ours is a world of the dying, then the next could possibly be the world of the living. What it's like, we may find out when Mystery Theatre returns shortly. An overworked teacher in a small grammar school explodes himself and the principal into... into what? He believes it's the world of the dead. But could he be someplace else? Some in-between state? It's a land where everything is shades of gray and green. Remember, it was a green powder that caused all this. A fact that does not escape those left behind. Were you able to get any sense out of the boy, Dorothy? Well, Billy says it was a, a green powder he found, brought it to class, and his chemistry teacher blew himself up with it, and that he and the principal just plain disappeared, blown to bits, no trace of them, Jim. The doggone part of it is you'd think an explosion like that would make some kind of noise. Oh, it knocked out a wall, but none of the children were hurt. So Billy brought that green powder, huh? We could be in for a peck of trouble. Do, do you really think so? Our son brings an explosive to school. His teacher and the principal are blown away. They could hold us responsible. They could? We're his parents, and he's underage. I wonder which teacher it was. Oh, Fred Plattner. You remember him. They've got Fred teaching chemistry? What does he know? No wonder everything went fluey. Oh, he's such a nice young man, too. No, I know that. Now... Promise you won't say anything to Billy tonight. He was very fond of Fred, too. No, 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 no. Don't, 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 Fred. Please, please, please don't. Jim, Jim, wake up. Jim, what is it? Jim, wake up. Huh? Oh, oh, Dorothy, I... I had such a nightmare. I, I was dreaming. Oh, don't that... tell me. Don't tell me. Why not? It was kind of crazy. I had a terrible dream, too, Jim. <sighs> Fred Plattner. He came right into this room and he motioned for me to follow him downstairs. Oh. And then he took out a small medicine bottle with green powder in it and was trying to give it to me. And then suddenly, it was gone. I saw him, too. By the whole closet. I mean, in my dream... He was standing by Billy's bed, and he had that same bottle in his hand, and he was shaking his head. And then I, I woke up. Poor Fred. He was too young to die. It was like he was trying to tell Billy something. That's what Fred did to me in my dream. Made me feel he wanted to tell me something. So, here I am, Fred Plattner, or maybe I should say I was Fred Plattner. Now I exist in this other world, and I'm trying hard to get through to the world I've been blown out of. To those incandescent, phosphorescent shadows of people and places I knew. It's very frustrating. Plattner, where the devil are we? Gee, I wish I knew, Professor Lidget. I was watching you before walking down that steep hill and stopping, and then you were shouting at some rocks. Well, I was trying to get through to Jimmy Carson. No go. He can't hear me. There must be a way to communicate with our world. Cut through the invisible barrier that separates us. Uh, Platinum, I, I think I'm getting a chill. I, well, it's sitting in one place, Professor Lidget. Uh, Give me your hand. Yes. Oh, up, up you go. Uh, now, we'll get ourselves off this cliff. Down there, it may be warmer. Oh, thank you, my boy. I'll follow you. I don't think I valued you when you were teaching at Sussexville. Yes, that's good. That's good. One step at a time. It's never as steep as you think. 
Um, I'll have to tell you, Professor, I have no idea where we're heading. But at least we're moving, and that's the best way to keep warm. Flattener, you know what's even more terrifying? I can hear you, and you can hear me, but that's all. There's no sound in this place. The leaves are moving, but no sound. The wind is blowing. You, you, you can feel it, but you can't hear a thing. We came down this cliff, not one footfall, not a sound. It's all like some mad, silent movie. Not a sound anywhere. Will you see who's at the door? I'm just clearing away the breakfast dishes. Billy was late getting off to school today. Honey, I've got to make tracks for work myself. Harry's been giving me the hairy eye lately, ever since that rumor went around town about Billy blowing up the school. Uh, oh, all right. Oh, hello, Sheriff. What can I do for you? Good morning, Jim. May I come in for a few minutes? Oh, sure. Is Billy home? Uh, who? Billy, your son. Oh, oh, yes. I, 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 I mean, no, 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 no. Billy's in school. He loves school. Wouldn't miss a day. Now, maybe it's just as well. Uh, sit down, Sheriff. Uh, can I get you some coffee? No, thanks. Who is it, Jim? What? Hello, Sheriff. What brings you here this early? I'll get to the point. You all know about that explosion at the school? Why, yes, I did hear something about that. Uh, accident in the chemistry lab or something, eh? We've been investigating, and I'm not so sure I can call it an accident. Fred Flatner and Professor Lidget have... <laughs> yes, that's a shame. We've questioned every boy who was in or near that class, Jim, and they all say the same thing. Well, Billy didn't mean anything by it. Honestly, he didn't. Dorothy, shut up. I, I, I mean, dear, let, let the sheriff tell us what's on his mind. I intend to. The information we've gathered is that your son brought a green powder into the class laboratory, and it was that that caused the explosion. A green powder? Well... Where could Billy have found such a thing? He never said anything about it to us, did he, dear? Jim, I think we should tell the sheriff. Well, there's nothing to tell. You asked where your son could have gotten such a powder. Three boys were with him when they all went to the lime kiln. He found it there and put it in the bottle. Oh, what three boys? Ted Jacoby, Matthew Goodman, and Tommy O'Shea. I know those kids. They'll say anything. You know how kids are. You're not going to believe the word of little kids, are you? Unfortunately, we have no adult witnesses. But as we piece the story together, this was no ordinary school experiment. Well, I don't see how you could hold my boy responsible for the mistakes of a teacher. So far as you know, then, Jim, this whole story about Billy and the green explosive is untrue? Absolutely. Is this Billy's school satchel? Yes, it is. Where did you find it? In the chemistry lab, under one of the seats. I'll be straightforward with both of you. We found traces of a green powder inside. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to have to ask you, Jim, to come along with me back to the station house. Well, I can't go there now. I'm due at work. I'm afraid you haven't got any choice, Jim. But what have I got to do with it? The law says that since Billy is underage, you, his father, are responsible. I have to book you, Jim. Book me? On what charge? Accessory to murder. Several days and nights went by in our green world. This particular morning when I awoke, Large, strange snowflakes were dropping all over me. Green snowflakes. And then, for the first time, the stillness was broken by a sound. Platner, you hear that? Ah, yeah, Bell. 
I think it comes from way down there in the gorge. Uh, let's get down there. Maybe there are people or someone who can help us. Oh, beautiful. Platinum, do you hear that? Hear what? The sound of our own footsteps. Things are starting to be a little bit more normal. And it's not so cold down here. Mm. Mm. Look at those gray craters. Will you look at that? I never. A great stone building. There's an entrance. Let's go on in. Wait a minute, Platner. Isn't there something wrong about it? Something peculiar? Well, nothing more peculiar than finding any gray skyscraper in a green world. It doesn't have any windows. It's like being inside a huge tomb. There are some flickering lights way down there. An altar. Uh, something's moving back there. Where? To the right of the altar. What looks like a torch burning a green flame. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Now, follow along the walls where that strange writing runs around the side. All the way to the right. Snowflakes. Big as a balloon, moving up and down. Let's get closer and have a look. No, I, I think I'll stay back here. If I go forward, Professor, you'll be alone here. Oh. Those large things. Their heads, floating heads, with, with sort of tails hanging from each one, like giant tadpoles in the air. They don't seem to have faces. One is turning around. It's got eyes. The others are turning now, too. They do have faces. <laughs> Look at them now. They're floating away. Uh, anyone here? Uh, something just flew into my face. Something cold. It's, it's, it's one of them. Who are you? Who are you? Ladner, I don't think I can take much more of this. Look back. What do you see? I see the school. Our school. The big assembly hall. And the boys are taking a test. <laughs> the midterms, that's what they are. Well, will you look at that? Some of them are using a crib. A pony. So they are. Cheating in a midterm. Platner, make a note which boys are cheating. No, I don't see the school anymore. It's changing now. I can see a street. It... Yes, it's Main Street. So it is. But how can we see Main Street from here? Because it runs right through us, uh, this world, this dimension. So that's where they went. Who went? Those floating faces. They're hovering over the people walking on the street, see? Look, one or two following each person, watching. Watching? Why are they there? They're watching the living. Platner, where are you? I'm here. I just don't want to look anymore. Oh, what's the matter with you? you you're crying. I know what those watchers of the living are doing. I know who they are. There are two of them above my head, aren't there? Yes, a man's face and a woman's face. I know them. I know who they are. The two faces over your head, you know them? It's my mother and father. H.G. Wells asks, who are these watchers of the living? Why do they so passionately watch those they have left forever? Is it that when our life is over, and evil or good are no longer a choice, that we may still have to watch the consequences of what we began? If this is so, then certainly Fred Platner and Professor Ligette have not died.
but have invaded that dimension which hangs over all of us. Mystery Theater will continue shortly. Let H.G. Wells continue his story. If human souls continue after death, then surely human interests can continue after death. So these watchers of the living keep an eye on earthlings. Make note that this in-between land is green, the color of renewal, of continuation, of movement. Therefore, this island in space and time into which our two men have stepped could be a moving platform. But to where? How many days has it been, Platner? No, how many times did I go to sleep and wake up? Uh, six, seven, eight? I can't be sure. We have only you to blame for this. I seem to remember that it was you, Professor, who said, why don't you set a match to the powder? Why do these infernal things have to hang around us? What have I done to them? Well, go, go on, get away from me. Go away. Do you hear me? I... I don't see how you stand these floating heads always following us, bumping us like balloons with faces. I am trying to be calm and not let myself go, and you must do the same, Professor. I could just as easily lose my nerve, but how would that help me? Hmm. Listen. They've stopped. You're in a different spot than I am, Platner. Your mother and father are watchers. I hope you never see your parents as I'm seeing mine. Not being able to speak to them and be understood. Not knowing whether they are real or shadows. No, no. I absolutely refuse to be fingerprinted and that's final. You have a right to call your lawyer. Where are the bodies? Where's Fred Platten? Where's the headmaster, Professor Lidget? How can you be sure they aren't still somewhere, wandering about in shock, maybe, but very much alive? If in over a week they haven't shown up? Amnesia. Do you know what that is, Sheriff? If I were blown up in some ridiculous experiment, it would addle my brains, too. They're alive, I bet you, but they don't know who they are or where. Well, that all may be true, but you're still responsible for what happened. Speak to the mayor if you want to, but you're not leaving here until formal charges are placed. It had all changed between Professor Lidget and myself. No longer were we of like mind in this limbo of the dead where there was no sunrise or sunset, where a green haze hung over vast cliffs and stone buildings without windows. We were enemies, and that didn't help. The day I hired you for the school, I must have been mad, Platner. You got us into this. Now, what are we going to do? Try to keep my head, for one thing. For another, I am going to sit here and have another try at getting through to Sussexville. No, oh, you have a formula. How are you going to do it? Concentrate. Mother, father, help me see our town. There. I can see right through that rock face. The walls of the house, like glass. Well, Professor, you got your wish. There's Billy Carson and his mother. They're standing in the kitchen listening to the telephone. There's unhappiness written on her face. I shouldn't wonder. That boy shouldn't be allowed out alone. He's a menace. They're talking to someone at the police station. Mother, father, I want to see what is happening there. Dorothy, honey, don't cry. They won't let me go home right now. I, I've called our lawyer. He's in court, but he'll get over here as soon as he can. Now, you just tell Billy what trouble he's caused. I don't know when I'll get home. I... I'll get there when I get there. That's all I know. This way, Mrs. Vandermill. 
I don't know what possibly could have come over that sales girl. I mean, to actually accuse me. Now, Mrs. Vandermill, there's nothing I can do. Maybe something did happen to fall off the perfume counter into my purse, but heavens to say I was shoplifting. Me, Helena Vandermill, why, I own half this town. Why would I ever steal anything? Uh, they did find some merchandise in your handbag. Oh. Who is that man sitting over there? He's in our custody. He's waiting for his attorney. Now, Mrs. Vandermill, if you'll kindly pay the fine, all the formalities will be taken care of. Oh, Sheriff, you are the most understanding public servant in this town. The fine, Mrs. Vandermill? Oh, yes, of course. Now, how, how much will it be this time? I'd say $50 would govern. Oh, $50 it is. Here you are. Uh, all I have with me is 20, so here are three, and do keep the change. Thank you, Mrs. Vanderman. Yes, I'll be more careful next time and keep my bag closed. Who was that? The richest old gal in town, but I have to haul her in at least once a week. She can't help shoplifting. Oh, well, why didn't you arrest her? Oh, I couldn't do that. Oh, well, why did you slip her fine in your pocket? I keep it safe there. Understand? Yeah, I'm beginning to. And how much would a little understanding cost me? Mr. Carson, I mean, Jim. I knew you'd understand the way we do business around here. I'm sorry I was a little slow. Uh, let me see what I have in my wallet. The crookedness in our town. I had no idea. Starting with boys cheating on their exams, all the way to the police taking bribes. Lidget and I had stopped talking. I was too tired one evening to keep my eyes open, and before I knew it, I was asleep. Platner! Platner, get up! What? 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 What's the matter? Get up! Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. <clears throat> Professor... What are you holding that rock in your hand for? I'm not staying here any longer. Well, how do you propose to leave? You're going to lead me back to the exact spot where we entered this other world. Well, I don't know that I remember it. Well, you'd better, if you don't want your head bashed in. Professor Lidget, I understand the strain you feel, but what good will it do you to hurt me? I don't care anymore. I've got to leave here. All right, all right. Let's start up this path and see if I can find the place. Hello, operator. I dialed 555-1212 and I got a wrong number. Would you place the call for me, please? It's the mayor's office. <laughs> it works every time. Uh, good morning, Mayor. Not too badly. We made $260. 60 from the old klepto, and I nicked another citizen for the 200 All right, will you stop by, or shall I send the cash over to the town hall? Good. I'll put 130 in an envelope addressed to you and marked official business. That little scene of conniving didn't escape me either. It made me wonder, did I really wish to return to the life I had grown up with? We climbed and finally reached a plateau which I thought looked familiar. Is this where we first landed? Are you sure? I'm as sure as I can be. You know, Professor, that world of ours, it's not what it's cracked up to be. No. No, it isn't. But it's the only game in town. And people aren't what they think they are. Blattner, you're still carrying that glass bottle with some green powder. Yes, I still have it. What's left? Why? Nothing. Just thinking. Hmm. It's finally dawned on me why the watchers of the living have such unhappy faces. 
What goes on on earth is enough to make anyone sad. Greed, deceit. With people you thought were honorable, people you respected. Even you, Lidget. You're much less of a human being than I thought you were. Much less. Lidget, what are you doing with that rock? Lidget, please! Please! <laughs> came to on earth, lying sprawled out in the schoolyard, covered in scratches and bruises. I was alone. Professor Lidget didn't get back to earth with me. I, I remembered running away from the professor, and uh, then I tripped and fell. Yes, the powder must have exploded on impact, and here I was. It was getting dark in Dr. Bendener's office, and... I remembered I'd come to see him for a physical. Feeling any better, Mr. Platner? Yes, I, I, I am. I'm fine now, Doctor. Had a little sleep? Oh, not exactly. Uh, just thinking about how my insides got all reversed. Nothing's malfunctioning, you understand. Just exchanged. Are you up to getting yourself home? Now, Dr. Bendener, I've decided I don't want to be a lifeguard after all. I'm just not the swimming kind. I didn't know there was any other kind. Oh, there are lots of ways lives can be guarded. Uh, I'd like to think about that. <laughs> think about what, Mr. Platner? Uh, what I ought to do uh, now that I'm back. Back? Uh, go back uh, to teaching. I think you should. Oh, well, they say that those who can do, uh, those who can't teach... I think I can, Doctor. And there's an awful lot of doing that Sussexville needs. Maybe I'll just give it a try. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. Some folks around Sussexville are still scratching their heads wondering where Fred Platner and Professor Leggett disappeared to for nine days and why the professor never came back. But Fred isn't telling anyone. Every now and then, though, he'll look up suddenly as if he was seeing someone he recognized. Who knows? Perhaps we are all being watched. Our cast included Tony Roberts... Bob Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, and Gilbert Mack. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams.